If you guys remember, Martin Luther King was more successful, quote unquote, than Malcolm X, for instance, in pushing his agenda because he didn't say white people stop being mean to us. He said, and this is why he marched on Edmund Pettus Bridge, where he knew there would be news coverage because he said, white people, if you continue to be publicly mean to us, you are going to continue to degrade your brand in the eyes of the greater world. And part of maintaining your supremacy globally is convincing the world that you're its savior. Don't stop beating us because you like us. Because you don't, you don't, there's no reason for you to. Stop beating us because it, it fucks up your brand. Oh. And then, unfortunately, the brother started talking about black economics and he had to, uh, he had to go. You know, I, I, I was having a conversation a while back and it, it was about Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres. And I think at the time, people were talking about how she mistreats her employees or she's a, a dick or whatever the case may be. I was like, you know, why are y'all surprised? She's so charitable. You know, her show is basically around poor people, black people, giving them money, giving them opportunity and the whole nine. During the conversation, I realized that we conflate gestures for intention, right? Because using Ellen as an example, and I'll tie this into Pearl. If it wasn't for her giving black kids a stage, if it wasn't for her giving black kids scholarships, if it wasn't for her giving black kids or black people money, she would have no show. So is she doing these things out of the kindness of her heart or is she doing these things for ratings? It should be clear to us that there is no incentive for white altruism for our community outside of, number one, maintaining a brand, and number two, in some way exploiting the perception of their altruistic gestures and altruistic thought. This white evangelical missionaryhood that we have grown to associate with whiteness. History will show you that missionaries were sent in to make the way smooth for the actual soldiers to come and fuck shit up. So yeah, you know, those people could be good people. Those people could have a clear heart and a good conscience in the whole nine, but like they are being used by the greater powers that be. Some of the quote unquote conservative black YouTubers whose only claim to fame is the fact that they make white people feel good about themselves. Whose only claim to fame is the fact that they parrot the things that white people wish they could say out loud in public. We need to evolve from thinking about racism as a micro interpersonal issue and thinking about it as a macro economic and structural issue. Again, going back to a global standpoint, how can a country like Nigeria or like Ghana, who are the size of Texas, maybe a little bit bigger, sit down at the same table and negotiate with the United States? Sit down at the same table and negotiate with the United Kingdom. Sit down at the same table and negotiate with a China. It can't happen. Now, you do your due diligence and you go backwards and you see how history affects today, you realize that there was a Berlin conference where they strategically fractured Africa so it would be easier to control. They pretty much shared it amongst themselves. The, the Spanish took this part, the uh, French took this part, the British took that part. Tangent real quick, I, I find it very interesting. I remember a couple years back, we were putting French flags in our profiles because of the bombing that had happened in, in, in France. And I, and I find it very interesting that the French have convinced us, especially us, that they are the romance capital of the world. When if you study French history, particularly as it pertains to Africa, you would see Africa and black people, you would see that the French are some of the most ruthless, ruthless people that this planet has ever seen. Do we want to talk about Haiti? Do we want to talk about the Congo? But to the average person, and unfortunately, a lot of our women, our own black women, when they think of romance, they think of Paris. When something happens in France, it affects us all. It's, it's, it's the depth of our Stockholm Syndrome is astounding. Shout out to a brother um, who watched one of my videos. He said something that I thought was brilliant. He said, stop pitching tents for clowns and there will be no, no more circus. And in, in, in the context that he was talking about, I, I got two things from it. Number one, pitching tents, you know, the, the euphemism for, you know, an erection when your pants are on, pitching a tent. 
AKA being aroused by problematic women, you know, clowns. Uh, but the other context that I understood it too was, you know, uh, creating platforms, creating, creating a, a, a stage for clowns, for spectacles, for, for personalities instead of people, for the loudest in the room, not the smartest. The loudest in the room, not the most thoughtful or the, the most considerate. If Just Pearly Things, MTR, Lead Attorney, and Obsidian did a stream, they would have more viewers than if Minister Louis Farrakhan gave a State of the Union address. I could bet right now, they would have more viewers and more listeners than if Louis Farrakhan himself gave a speech. And we want white folks to take us seriously? Where these are the figures that we prop up? That's where our, our, our economic propel, uh, propellant goes. Because I, I think sometimes I'm like, okay. And, and this is part of the reason why I'm such a big fan of T.S. San Johnson. Because even as a 29-year-old young man, when I project out, okay, what happens if person A becomes the biggest thing since sliced bread? What is the consequence? What is the consequence if person B becomes the biggest thing since sliced bread? And I, I, I thought that that is how grown-ass men thought. Right? What's the, what's the consequence if Tiasan Johnson gains wealth and notoriety and is able to fund his research and is able to properly and thoroughly establish the Institute for Black Male Studies and, and establish that black men are worth studying past our utility and past the ways that we fuel the system? What is the consequence of that on a global historical scale? What's the consequence of if some white girl from the Midwest is the biggest thing since sliced bread? What's the consequence of some nigga who does reaction videos is the biggest thing since sliced bread? What's the consequence of some old nigga who, who just gets on uh, YouTube and acts like it's a radio show becomes the biggest thing since sliced bread? How does that affect the bottom line? How does that affect my son or my son's son? And what, what, what frustrates me is that, like we could talk about a space that claims to be pro-black male not being pro-black. We can talk about that, but what frustrates me is any group of men who are not solutions oriented to me are a waste of space. Because I, I thought, I thought, I assumed that was our advantage over women. I, I assumed that as women stewed in the catharsis of their emotions and women stewed in, you know, their feelings and their traumas, that men were solution oriented. What I've seen in the past year being on YouTube, past couple of months with this conversation, is that no, a lot, a lot of men, unfortunately, they are the women that they complain about.